Um, I'm going to talk on pseudorandomness from the point of view of cryptography and derandomization of algorithms. Okay. Um, so the use of randomness in, uh, in algorithms uh, sort of predates computer science theory in that I think people were using randomness um, or thinking they were using randomness in Monte Carlo algorithms you know, as soon as there were computers, essentially, um, to do things like complicated integrals or simulations. Now, of course, they weren't actually using randomness, so people were also thinking about pseudorandomness from the very early uh, times there were computers. And a famous example is, is von Neumann has a famous um, proposal for how to generate pseudorandom sequences. He was one of the first, I think, to publish um, an algorithm for pseudorandomness. So, um, so, but it wasn't until the late 70s that randomized computation and pseudorandomness became a, a, a sort of stable part of, of computer science theory. And uh, the reason sort of, it, it, there were a number of, um, randomized algorithms that for important problems that were, were introduced at that time, you know, we couldn't ignore as just sort of a fluke. Um, and um, there was also the, the dawn of public key cryptography and uh, thinking that cryptography was part of complexity theory. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, you know, some of the randomized algorithms that were introduced in the late 70s include um, primality testing, polynomial identity testing, um, using random walks to, to test um, uh, undirected graph connectivity with just logarithmic amounts of memory, um, and, uh, and some approximation algorithms, some easy approximation algorithms like, uh, I'm gonna give an example, um, uh, two approximation for max cut. Um, Okay, and these are chosen um, both for their importance, but especially the last one to illustrate a point. Okay, um, and at the same time, uh, RSA um, Diffie-Hellman introduced a complexity theoretic take on cryptography, and in cryptography, you definitely need to randomly generate strings. So it was kind of counterintuitive, at least for some people, that randomness was helpful in algorithm design, but, um, but sort of mandated that, that you have randomness for cryptographic purposes. Okay. So, um, so I'm gonna quickly go through um, some of these applications and see where, how they're using randomness and forward the story uh, about these particular problems to, to what's happening recently. Okay, this is actually a lot of um, them have exciting new developments. So um, primality testing, you're given an n bit number, um, p, and you're asked is p prime, okay? Now, um, uh, so the, the probabilistic algorithm is from uh, Rabin and Solovey Strassen were based on using the Fermat-Little theorem uh, that a, if p is prime, a to the p minus one is congruent to one mod p. It's not quite an if and only if condition. I'm gonna brush that under the rug. There are techniques to, to, to get around the uh, Carmichael numbers, which are, are sort of composites that also have this property. Okay, you have to do a little bit of number theory. But what they, what they said was the, the algorithm that will test prime essentially is just to pick a random number and see if that, um, see if that um, Fermat test holds for that random number. Okay, and if P is not prime, then most of the time you, you get, uh, with rare exceptions, you get a counterexample. Yes. Yes. No problem. Okay, so, um, did I put it up right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so flash forward to, actually, flash back first, we'll do like a lost thing. 
Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the story should go, you know, people introduced this randomized algorithm for primality, and then people thought about how to make deterministic versions. But the story actually goes that people de-randomize the algorithm and then introduce the randomized algorithm. <laughs> so um, Gary Miller basically had a de deterministic version of the same algorithm that Rabin and Salve Strassen were, were using. He just couldn't completely prove that the algorithm worked. He only proved it if the extended Riemann hypothesis were true. And the algorithm is essentially take the solvay strassen algorithm and replace the randomness with the following pseudorandom sequence, two, three, four, five, so on, <laughs> and, and see if that, <laughs> those uh, pseudorandom numbers give you, give you a, a witness of non-primality. Okay. And the extended Riemann hypothesis basically says that these you know, the, the, the witnesses are sort of scattered uniformly, and so there's no reason they shouldn't be uh, small integers. Okay, so, um, okay, but uh, um, Agrawal and Biz Biswal in, uh, published in 03, um, but actually considerably before then, uh, gave a, an alternative probabilistic algorithm that's slightly more sophisticated, um, based on looking at the polynomial x to the p minus one minus one modulo some other polynomials, some random polynomials. And that was um, unconditionally de-randomized by Agrawal, Kyle, and Saxena, no assumptions. And so that was a big breakthrough, but it was proving something, primes, primality testing was in polynomial time, it was proving something that we already basically knew, but uh, but didn't know how to prove. So it wasn't big news that it was true, it was big news that it was proved. Okay. So um, another basic pro probabilistic algorithm introduced around the same time um, what is polynomial identity testing. Here you've got an algebraic circuit where it has a, an expression that has gates for addition, multiplication, uh, subtraction, multiplication by constants, and so on, has, has n input variables. And uh, so you can get a, a fairly complicated expression. Um, and the question is, um, it, it's going to represent a polynomial, but more succinctly than writing out the polynomial term by term. And the question is, is this, a, this is polynomial identi the identically zero polynomial? Okay. And uh, Schwartz and Zippel um, came up with the following very simple probabilistic algorithm. You just plug in random numbers, random integers as your variables within a certain large but um, representable range, okay? And um, you evaluate the poly you evaluate the circuit. Now, one problem is that the numbers involved when you start multiplying large numbers grow exponentially, and so you can't really evaluate the circuit at the points. So you pick a random modulus and evaluate the circuit um, mod that modulus, which avoids this problem of, of integers growing, and you can prove without much difficulty that um, with high probability, if the result is non-zero, the result mod a random modulus is non-zero. Okay, so this is another simple probabilistic algorithm. So how much progress have we made on making deterministic algorithms for polynomial identity testing? Essentially, unlike for primality, we've made no progress for polynomial identity testing, except for very restricted kinds of circuits like depth three circuits. Okay, and, and even to, to, to look at these very restricted classes of circuits involves a lot, de-randomizing them involves a lot of work. Okay. So, um, so some problems can be de-randomized, other problems looks harder to de-randomize, or at least we don't know how. Okay. Um, another example on my list was undirected graph connectivity. So here, 
um, is a little bit different in that we're trying to save memory rather than time. So um, the undirected graph reachability problem is, um, is you have an undirected graph and two nodes, u and v, in the, in the uh, graph. And you want to know, is v reachable from u? For directed graphs, this is not complete for non-deterministic log space. So if we had a log memory algorithm, then non-deterministic log space would equal log space. That would be a big result. But um, um, uh, Alelunius, Karp, Lipton, Lovash, and Rakoff uh, showed that it's in randomized log space algorithm. Okay. And the algorithm is incredibly simple. You just take a random walk in your graph from you. If you go more than a certain number of steps without reaching V, you um, terminate and conclude that V is probably not reachable at all. Yes? Uh, so right now, for this algorithm, we don't um, make any assumptions. It's an arbitrary directed gra undirected graph with an Well, so we're trying to solve the problem with just remembering logarithmic amount in the size of the graph. If the graph is small, then we have smaller amounts of resources. So, it, it, and we're looking asymptotically, so it only makes sense as the graph size grows. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, oh, the number of steps is polynomial. Oh, the, in the number of nodes, for example, it, I think the original analysis was, was something like n to the fifth or so. Okay. Um, but it, it was improved later. Okay. So, so the important thing is with log memory, you can uh, remember where you are in the graph, the name of a vertex, and with log memory, you can remember how many time steps you've, you've been going, so you know how to turn time out. Okay, sorry about the, the slide. Okay, so um, like primality, this algorithm uh, was recently de-randomized. And it, it, not only was there a deterministic log memory algorithm for the same problem, but it went by substituting clever moves for random moves, for um, cleverly chosen pseudo-random moves for in, in the place of random moves. Okay. So, um, so in the way it did these clever moves is based on uh, new constructions of expanders that maybe Avi will mention in his talk. I'm not sure. So I'm not going to uh, talk much more about that. Okay. So, um, my last example is more of a toy example than the, the, the previous ones. It's a, it's a hard approximation problem. You're given an undirected graph, okay? And you want to partition the vertices into two disjoint sets, S and S complement, to maximize the number of edges crossing from one to the other. The, and I'm just giving you the trivial algorithm, rather probabilistic algorithm, rather than the sophisticated al algorithms of uh, people like Goleman and Williamson. But, you know, it actually, the question about randomness versus derandomization works almost the same. Okay. So, um, so you're trying to maximize the number of edges going from one set to the other. And, and that's an NP-hard problem. So we, we can't hope to actually do it. But here's a very trivial uh, two approximation that's guaranteed to get half the edges in the graph and hence half the maximum cut. You simply pick your partition at random, put every node on one side or the other equally likely. Okay? And since every edge is equally likely to be a cross edge as it is to be on the same side, the expected cut is half the edges. I'm going to put that over here. Let's see. Well, how could we do this just as well? 
um, deterministically. Okay, and then again, I'm not going to do the most sophisticated version. Okay, well, to what extent are we using the full randomness of the situation? Our, our analysis of this randomized algorithm was very local. All we were doing is we wanted something that edge by edge um, had a 50-50 chance of putting the edge in the, in, the, in the cut. Okay, So all we really need from a random, quote, random source to solve this, to do just as well, is to have that property that for every two, pit, two nodes, they're on one side of the cut, the same side of the cut, equally likely as they are on the other side. So if you think of, of um, uh, you know, the cut is described by a sequence of bits, left, right, left, right, we just want the, the bits in the two, and every vertex is, a, is sort of a row, okay? We want the number of agreements in, a, in between two rows to equal the number of disagreements, okay? Well, actually there's a name for that kind of matrix, it's a Hadamard matrix, and there's a very simple construction of a Hadamard matrix with n rows, or n columns, I should say. Um, and that's to, um, to think of all the, the n elements as being vectors of length, bit over ZF2 of length um, log n, and to use inner product mod 2 as to determine what the bit of the matrix is. And it's very easy to check that this matrix has the property that um, if you look at any two rows, they have exactly the same number of agreements as disagreements. And so if we pick a random column of that matrix and think of that as the randomness in our source, um, that pseudo-random source for the purposes of this algorithm will do just as well as a random source since there are only n possible cuts we can just try them all and see which one is best. So we don't actually need, once we've gotten the amount of randomness that we're using down to essentially log in, we, don't, we can do exhaustive search and have only polynomial amount of blow up. Now, this isn't the best approximation algorithm for this problem, and this isn't even the best way of de-randomizing the one I gave, the approximation algorithm I gave, but this gives um, I, I hope this is insightful for why sometimes we can replace the randomness with pseudo-randomness and have our algorithm work. Okay. And moreover, that Hadamard uh, matrix is going to come back again. Okay. So, um, and my final application of randomness was, in, was for cryptography. In cryptography, uh, if you want any kind of security, you know, so the, the modern cryptography takes the point of view that the adversary will know all the algorithms, will know all your protocols. The only thing you have secret that gives you an advantage over the adversary is um, a source of random information. If you're deterministic, the, the adversary can just simulate the, the honest parties and hence do anything the honest parties can do. There's no way of distinguishing between honest parties and attackers. Okay, so, um, so cryptography really isn't possible in a deterministic world. Um, okay. So, um, so all these considerations um, pose fundamental challenges to the, to the state of complexity theory. Um, so we had defined complexity theory with respect to deterministic algorithms, but here um, a lot of the basic problems had randomized algorithms. Um, but on the other hand, you know, maybe these randomized algorithms were mainly heuristics for deterministic algorithms. So we're left with the following kind of uh, fundamental question. Is 
the ability to make random choices, does this change our comp the power of our computational model? Does it give us new problems that can be solved in polynomial time? Or is it just, um, you know, is every time we can solve problems with randomness, with more thought we can solve them without randomness, and so randomness is just a design methodology for constructing deterministic algorithms. There's no question that randomness is useful in algorithm design. But is it a conceptual tool or does it actually change the model? Okay. So, um, and when can we eliminate randomness from algorithms or reduce, at least reduce the amount of randomness that we use for algorithms? Because so people were using pseudo-random generators from, you know, to, to, to run these randomized algorithms even before we had analysis of randomized algorithms. Why? Because it's really actually hard to get your hands on random bits. Okay? So, um, especially, you know, sort of online. Um, and for cryptographic purposes, you have to get your hands on random bits that aren't known to anybody else. So it's actually kind of tricky. How do you come up with these randomness and random bits in the, in the uh, first place? So if we can't eliminate randomness, maybe we want to reduce the amount of randomness we use. Think, treat of it, think of it as an expensive resource in its own right. Okay. Okay. As we said, for some applications, um, actually, this is out of order. Okay, so um, so the first so that sort of introduction motivation. Um, okay, so what do we mean by um, replacing randomness with pseudo randomness? Okay, so um, um, so in general, what we're trying to do is imitate n bits of randomness with l bits of randomness where l is much smaller than n. And the way we have to do this was we take our l bits of randomness and plug them into some deterministic process algorithm or generator um, g and have that stretch to n bigger than l bits of pseudo randomness. And you know the efficiency is in the running time of g but it's also in the relationship between n and l the smaller L is compared to N, the better, the better um, we are at saving this precious randomness resource. Okay? And so um, when we have such a, gen a generating process, one way of thinking about it is in terms of this algorithm, the generator itself. Another equivalent way of thinking about it is the d distribution on possible outputs the generator produces. I'm going to call that D sub G. And a third, and we'll be comparing d sub g to the, another distribution, u sub n, the uniform distribution on n bits. And a third way is, um, especially for derandomizing algorithms, is uh, to look at the range of the generator, the multiset of possible pseudo-random strings that the generator could output. Okay, and so um, we'll want to, you know. We want these distributions to look random without actually having a lot of entropy. Um, we want this set to look like it contains random strings um, while being easily constructible and relatively small in size. And we'll go back and forth between those three ways of looking at a generator. Okay. So, um, so then we have to ask, when is such a generator, so that's the kind of object we'll be looking at, but when is it actually good? Or at least good enough for some purpose, okay? So, um, so as I said, so we're gonna be looking at comparing the distribution output by our generator to the uniform distribution, and maybe later we'll be looking, comparing it to other, you know, other pairs of distributions. So the question is, when does one distribution, more general question is, when does one distribution look like another distribution? 
Okay. So um, I was going to use the, the following analogy. So we, um, all, almost all the definitions of when a pseudorandom generator is good use some kind of indistinguishability test. And I don't know if you're um, too young to remember, you know, when there were these ads, when first when, when margarine was considered healthy <laughs> um, and butter wasn't, um, and when there were these ads that, uh, that um, for products like, I can't believe it's not butter, uh, that would try to sell you their margarine that, um, and convince you that you could use it instead of butter. So they would have like blind taste tests and things to try to convince you that you can use their product, be healthy, and still um, have the experience of butter. So, um, so this is same kind of, indis you know, we use the same kind of criterion, indistinguishability, you know, another example is the Turing test. Can you tell whether someone's human or a computer? The same kind of indistinguishability criterion to say when two distributions look like each other. Okay. So, um, so more precisely, we're going to have some family of tests, which are just Boolean functions on the class of outputs of the generator. Okay. And we'll say that, um, D1 and D2 are epsilon indistinguishable with respect to this class of tests if for every test in the family, the probability that the test um, accepts something from D1 is very close within epsilon of the same probability if, it's if this input is produced according to D2. So remember, in our case, D1 is going to be outputs of the generator. D2 is going to be uniform strings of length n. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, you know, the there was this kind of prehistory for pseudo randomness, and um, before the theorists got involved, and um, what people looked at were how well pseudo random generators pass certain statistical tests. Okay. And um, so you can see, think of this as, you know, is there some obvious way? of telling that, um, that a sequence isn't random, okay? Is there some correlation on the bits? Is there some uh, predictable period where things, the sequence just starts repeating itself and so on? Um, correlations between, you know, consecutive bits, things of that nature, okay? And so they wrote down statistical, they wrote down things that could go wrong with a pseudorandom generator, and then they checked that their new pseudorandom generator avoided these things. So it was indistinguishable from random according to test one, test two, and so on. And when you got to test 100 and you produce your pseudorandom generator and it still didn't work, people found a problem, you added it to your list, and that was test 101. So, um, so, sort of like, is there um, a superficial reason, you know, can we actually, like, does this thing not taste like butter? Does this thing not smell like butter? Does this, do these numbers not smell random? Okay. So that was sort of the approach before uh, theory really got involved. Okay. But the, the problem with that approach, okay, now, Sometimes statistical tests work fine. Sometimes you can take your algorithm and analyze the specific combinatorics, like we did with the max cut here as uh, approximation algorithm. And then we can, you know, once we have a, a source that's guaranteed to fool that particular test or that particular family of tests, um, then we can go ahead and substitute that for randomness in our algorithm. But a lot of other of the algorithms, like the primality test, do kind of complicated things with the, with the randomness. So they don't just spread it on a piece of bread. They do some kind of recipe with it, okay? And even if, you're, even if your numbers smell like randomness, okay, taste like randomness, when you start with them, once you cook with them, 
then they may no longer, the results may be different, right? So, um, so after you, the results of the recipe, even if you can't taste the difference between margarine and butter, when you use it in a recipe, the recipe, w you replace your butter with margarine and you use it in a recipe, it may go horribly wrong for some reason. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so, you know, if you think about it, each algorithm gives us a particular class of tests. Okay? The test we have to fool for that algorithm is you want to, for every input, you have the test that simulates the algorithm using randomness R on that input. Okay? And you want to know, does anything go wrong? Does any, is anything different if we use for, for these, this class of tests, if we replace the randomness with pseudorandomness. And as we said before, sometimes we can characterize this as a nice combinatorial property and hence de-randomize the algorithm, but many times we can't, or it seems difficult. Okay. So, um, okay. And that just says that. So, you know, but then uh, we could go one step further, right? And you say, well, cooking is a chemical process. So, um, you know, let's look at the class of all chemical processes that we could do with a reasonable amount of, of, of chemicals and time and, and number of reactions. And if we can't distinguish your product from, from butter with, with uh, you know, uh, a crime lab, then I certainly can't do it in my kitchen. If I can't do it in my kitchen, then, um, then whatever recipe um, I cook won't be able to distinguish. Okay. Well, this seems, so this seems like an overkill for algorithms, but um, certainly from the point of view of cryptography, we have to worry about someone actively attacking our source of randomness. Okay? So someone with resources, um, with, you know, with, an, uh, with a fair amount of resources, um, is going to be trying to distinguish our numbers from random numbers. Okay? Um, and so to get cryptographic security, we need to have to be indistinguishable, not just from some particular class of tests, even particular class of tests that belong to a particular algorithm, but for any tests that involve a reasonable amount of resources, uh, for example, any, any test that can be done in probabilistic polynomial time, or a non-uniform version is any class of tests that can be done on, by a um, polynomial size circuit family. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, and in particular, if we can fool all of those tests, well, the algorithm, you know, if we can fool a malicious attacker who's really trying just to, just to tell whether uh, the number is random or pseudorandom, we certainly should be able to fool an algorithm that's making use of this randomness. You know, that isn't trying to tell, but may incidentally, mistakenly tell the difference. Okay. So, um, so this notion of cryptographically uh, secure pseudorandom generators was introduced by Blum and Macaulay and then uh, fine-tuned by Yao uh, in the early 80s. Okay. Um, now, their motivation was to uh, have a, a generator that was going to be useful in reducing randomness in cryptographic protocols. Okay. So, um, so it was very important that the number of out, for example, that the number of output bits be much larger than the amount of randoms inside. Okay. 
uh, that the generator be very easy to compute, say polynomial time, and it had to fool adversaries um, that were much more powerful than, you know, had much more resources than the people using the protocol. Okay, so the class of tests, there was sort of an implicit um, parameter, how much time I gave the adversary, um, so that amount of time had to be much bigger than the amount of time the generator used itself. Okay, um, and for cryptographic purposes, um, so we said there are two ver variants, uniform adversaries or non-uniform adversaries. For cryptographic purposes, both made sense. Okay, so um, non-uniform adversaries is stronger, but probably uniform at being secure against uniform adversaries was good enough for most purposes. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so, sorry this slide got messed up. Um, so this cryptograph notion of cryptographically secure pseudorandom generators had a number of immediate applications that people were thinking about before they constructed it, um, which was to, to, you know, randomness is expensive, especially for cryptographic purposes because you have to keep it secret. Pseudorandom generators would minimize that expense Strong pseudorandom generators could minimize that expense. Okay. Um, randomness, you know, if you have a, a private key system, you have to agree on a common key. That's kind of uh, uh, the very expensive. Okay. So if you have a pseudorandom generator, you can agree on a much smaller key and use it basically indefinitely um, as a stream cipher to send messages back and forth. Okay, um, so those were the immediate applications, but it actually turned out that once the idea of cryptographic pseudorandom generators were in play, cryptographic generators, uh, pseudorandom generators could be used for a wide variety of cryptographic protocols, I think beyond uh, the dreams of Blum and Macaulay when they introduced the idea. I don't know, they're big dreamers. <laughs> okay, so, um, so pseudoran cryptographic pseudorandom generators have become uh, very important in um, both the theory and practice of, of cryptography. Okay, so um, question is, do these pseudorandom generators exist? And, uh, you know, they have to be based on some kind of hard problem. If we could solve like satisfiability, we could tell whether something's in the range of the generator and hence distinguish between random and pseudorandom. So they have to be based on some kind of complexity assumption. So what kind of complexity assumption uh, is the minimal assumption where we can get useful pseudorandomness out of it? Okay. So now, even if we assume P is different from NP, um, that just gives us a guarantee of worst case hardness, but for any kind of cryptographic problem, you know, utility, worst case hardness isn't enough. We need some kind of reliable hardness, some way of generating problems that are going to be reliably hard. Okay. But even generating problems that are really hard for everybody is not enough. Because you can't actually base cryptographic security on a problem that's hard for everybody. Okay? Because a problem that's hard for everybody, just like a problem that's easy for everybody, doesn't distinguish between the honest participants and the attackers. So, you know, asking, setting um, your password by the answer to some question that you can't figure out isn't it more helpful than setting your password to, to something that everybody knows? Okay. So, um, so that leaves, so we have um, a minimal assumption that we'll need for uh, cryptographic pseudorandom generation of being able to, or even any problem in cryptography, 
um, is a method to generate hard problems where we know the solution. So they're hard for everybody else, but easy for us. So I like to think of this as, you know, um, a lot of us are, are faculty members. We're going to be giving out exams. We need to, you know, giving out homework. You know, we need to be able to write up the answer key. So we don't want to give problem, out problems that we don't know the solutions to. Other than that, we want to torment the students. So we want to give the problems that are as hard as possible, but where we can generate the answer key first, and then give the problems based on the answer key. Okay? And a one-way function is exactly that kind of, of process, where you generate the answer key first, and then generate the problem from the answer. Okay? So, um, so a one-way function is an easily computable function from, say, some number m bits to n bits. doesn't have to be the same. So, that, um, so we think of the problem as the output of the function, and the problem is to find any input that corresponds to that output. And we've generated that output by picking an input, so we know one solution. There may be other solutions, but well, we want it to be hard, reliably hard, to, for an adversary to get any other solution. So uh, the adversary wins if we give it f of x, uh, it does some computation and finds some other inverse x or some other inverse of f of x. Okay, and so um, we want the, for any uh, limited time adversary, we want the probability that adversary solves our problem to be less than, say, um, to be very small. Okay, um, so the problem is easy for the person who, who designed the problem, but hard for everybody else. Okay. So, um, so there was a long line of work um, saying if you've got a particular kind of one-way function, then you've got a pseudorandom generator. Um, and this line of work cum cumul ended <laughs> uh, with work by Hasta, Levin, Luby, and myself. Uh, where we show that any one-way, that pseudorandom generators exist if and only if one-way functions exist. Cryptographic pseudorandom generators. Okay. And uh, we're going to, so after, uh, probably after the break, I'm going to talk about another class of generators that aren't useful for cryptography, but are just as, are just as good for derandomizing algorithms. Um, that are also called pseudorandom generators. So for now, pseudorandom generator means the kind of generator I've defined already. Okay. So, um, so how do we get, um, how do we convert a one-way function? Uh, and another reason why I'm going to, so I'm going to sketch the proof from Hill, um, or at least the construction from Hill. Um, one reason I'm going to, to go into a little bit of detail here is that it introduces some combinatorial tools that are interesting in their own right in understanding randomness, such as uh, extractors. Okay. Um, or at least I'm going to state it as if we had extractors, the way we should have done it. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, and it also emphasizes the connection between um, pseudorandom generators in the complexity point of view and other kinds of, of combinatorial pseudorandom objects, such as um, extractors, as I said before, and error correcting codes, um, which are going to again come up in a minute. Okay. So, um, so the outline is, first, we're going to show, we're going to weaken our goal. We said it's important that the number of output bits be much larger than the number of input bits. 
we're going to say, actually, it's enough if we get one more output bit. Okay. This was, um, okay, this is sort of a folklore result. I think it was actually written up by um, Goldwasser and Macaulay, or Goldwasser, Goldreich and Macaulay. Goldreich and Macaulay? Some, some of those. Uh, okay. So um, then we're going to say, well, how can we get that one bit? Because what we assumed it sort of is, is hard to get an inverse, so an, N, uh, an M bit string from this N bit string. How do we condense that hardness of computing an M bit string down to a single bit that so hard that it looks kind of random? Okay. That's going to be from uh, uh, Goldreich Levin. Okay. Then we're going to say, well, how do we uh, extract the randomness from the so we have that one bit of randomness, but now we have to get back the randomness from our input to make it one bit plus the randomness from our input. So we're going to use a notion of extractor to extract the randomness, the entropy of the output distribution. Okay. Well, but what if the function's not one to one? Then that might not be enough. So we'll have to actually also extract the randomness from the input distribution. So we will get that one bit the entropy of the output distribution, and then, the con and then we'll extract the conditional entropy of the input distribution given the output distribution, together with the entropy of the output distribution, that will be as much random as we put in, plus that one more secret bit that we got in step two. Okay? And then the part that I'll hide is really what makes our paper hard. Um, you know, this was the, the ideas, and then uh, the hard part came from uh, not knowing what the entropies are, uh, especially sort of locally. And there you have to do some messy stuff that I won't talk about at all. Okay. So, um, so why does um, getting one extra bit suffice? Okay. Um, so say we've got a generator G0 that on given L bits gives us L plus one bits, we want to construct a generator that given L bits com computes N bits for N much bigger than L. Okay? And so we're going to use our, our generator G0 uh, iteratively as follows. Okay. So um, we're going to take our, our input an input to the generator G0, length L, okay, call that S0, and we're going to feed that to the generator G0. Okay. That's going to give us L plus 1 bits. We take the first bit and output it, take the remaining L bits, and we put that, we think of that as the random input to G0 again. Again, we get L plus 1 bits, we output the, second, the first bit of those L, batch of L plus 1, take the remaining L, put it in the generator again. And we just iterate this process. And we can, uh, it turns out that the, the loss in security is basically linear in the number of bits we output. Uh, so we can do this for uh, basically any polynomial amount of time, number of steps. Okay. Okay. So then the, the second step is how do we, we're going to take the, um, the problem of guessing the whole inverse to our function and condense it down to a single bit. Okay? Um, so it's hard to guess all n bits of our input. But that doesn't mean it's hard to guess the least significant bit. It doesn't mean it's hard to guess the most significant bit. And if you look at particular examples, there are examples of conjectured one-way functions where the, that leaked the, the last bit or the first bit. Okay? Um, or a middle bit or any other particular bit that you have in mind. So we're going to give a randomized construction of a hard bit. So the Goldreich Levin construction is you pick a vector of length n at random, and we're going to look at um, 
this is a vector over ZF2. Look at our, in, our hidden input as a vector over GF2. And say the hidden bit is the inner product of these two vectors. Okay? So it's the parity of some random subset of the bits. Okay. And the problem is that what we want to claim is that not only is this bit hard to compute, it's hard even to guess more than you could guess a random bit. So this bit looks random given f of x and also given what vector v you're talking about. Okay, so for most v's. So, so what, how Goldreich and Levin argue this is they say, well, let's look at an adversary and let's fix the value of y equals f of x and sort of ignore that. Okay? Now, the adversary given f of, given y, which is fixed, and v outputs a guess for v inner product x. Okay? Call that guess a of v. Okay? So, um, so what we know is that that guess is correct, correctly predicts the inner product of x and v a half plus epsilon of the time. Okay? So, um, so what, we'll, what they give is an algorithm that takes this, out, this, this guesser A as a black box and um, outputs at least a, not necessarily just X, but a list of strings that's not too long that with very high probability contains X, the string we have in mind. In fact, it contains all the strings where, that have this kind of agreement where the guesser has a, an agreement with the inner product. And x will be on that list. Okay. So what's really going on in this algorithm? Okay. Um, so what I claim is that what's really going on is we have some kind of decoding of an error correcting code. Okay. So what's an error correcting code? An error correcting code, you have a message that you want to send to somebody else, okay, um, and you're going to define, the, the code defines a, a function that you compute of this message that you actually send through the channel. But the channel is very noisy. What gets to, on the other end is not C of M, but some message, received message, R, that has some correlation to C of M, okay. Um, and then we go through some decoding process and we get back some message M prime. And the, what makes a code good is that if we didn't remove, you know, if R really has at least some correlation to the message that we sent, C of M, then we get back M. If we didn't get back M itself, that's called a unique decoding algorithm. But sometimes we can't get back just one message that we absolutely know is the message sent, but can get back a list of possible messages that's called a, that contains the message that was sent. That's called a list decoding algorithm. Okay? Probably familiar to, to a lot of you, at least. Okay. And, um, and, um, the code that is implicit in the Goldreich-Levin construction is the same code that we use to de-randomize the max cut algorithm, the Hadamard code, right? Because we're saying, look at all the, the, the rows are all the X's. Those are the messages we could be sending. The code of the message we think of as all the possible pair, you know, inner products with different vectors of, of length n. Okay? So that's an exponentially long code. We can't actually sort of write down that code. What we've got is an adversary, though, that has a correlation to that code word. We have an adversary that has a half plus epsilon. You give it v, it has a half plus epsilon uh, advantage in predicting, in predicting the bit of the code. Okay. So if we think of that adversary as a vector of length 2 to the n, 
we run it on all, all inputs V, that's a vector that has a positive correlation with the actual Hadamar code of X. Okay? And so what um, Goldreich and Levin are doing is giving a list decoding of the Hadamar code. And it's a list decoding algorithm in a very special form. It doesn't have time to read the whole received word even. Okay? It can only make um, random queries to places in that word and has to get back the list of possible messages sent. Okay. So, so we can restrate the, the Goldreich-Levin uh, result as there is a, a list decoding algorithm for the Hadamard code that's local in the sense that it only makes a very small amount of queries to bits of the, of the received, received word. Okay. And moreover, this kind of local list decoding algorithm has become uh, very important in um, the design of codes, but also in complexity in general. There are a number of different list decodable codes locally list decodable codes, you could replace the Goldreich-Levin bit with any of these codes and, prove, and it would have the same consequences for, for cryptographic pseudorandom generators. Okay. So we have a way of getting one really random looking bit about the input. Okay. So now, if the, if the function, if our function we start with is both one to one and onto, so it maps n bits to n bits, and it, there are no collisions, um, then this gives us our pseudorandom generator. Okay? We have our new generator is going to have x in that inner product vector v. It's going to output f of x. f of x is uniformly, because it's one to one and onto, it's uniformly distributed among output, so it's n bits of randomness. Okay. V was randomly chosen and independent of X, and then we have this hidden bit that looks random, X inner product V. Okay, so two n bits of input gives a, of random input give us two n plus one bits of pseudorandom output. Okay. What if this function um, is one to one? Let's drop the assumption that it's that you know the range is the same size of the input uh, as the domain. So it's one to one, but it's onto just a small fraction of the possible range. Okay. So then, you know, that first part doesn't you know has n bits of entropy, but they're not uniformly distributed bits of entropy. And so this construction doesn't work right off the bat. But it sort of gives, gives us an idea, right? Is we have, we're entitled to n bits of entropy from f of x. Okay. They're not um, uniformly distributed, but maybe there's a way of forcing them to become uniformly distributed. Put that up over here. So our goal is to take this kind of messy distribution and make it into the uniform distribution. This is exactly what um, extractors were meant to do. Okay? So, the, the, so extractor is just a name for a tool that takes messy entropy and makes it into uniform bits. And uh, it comes up in this, in this construction of a pseudorandom generator, but extractors are very interesting in their own right whenever you're dealing with randomized algorithms. Because nature gives us, you know, sort of physics tells us nature has randomness to it. But it doesn't tell us that nature has uniform bits ready to be plucked, right? It just says there's some randomness 
You have quantum processes. You can't predict them totally, but that doesn't mean that they're exactly 50-50 events and independent. Okay? So, you think of where we get randomness in the first place is through these kind of sources like sunspot activity or zener diode radiation decay or something like this. And we're guaranteed there's some entropy to these processes, possibly, but we're not at all guaranteed that the processes themselves give us unbiased, uncorrelated random bits. Um, so, so what the idea of an extractor is, is a, is a way of purifying the randomness that we get from a flawed random source. Okay, so, um, so an ext now the bad thing, bad news is that unless you assume something about this flawed random source in addition to its entropy, you can't do it, okay, without spending some randomness of your own, okay? So to make randomness, you need to spend randomness, okay? You need to have randomness. So we'll think of S as a relatively small, truly random seed that we're going to use to purify the randomness in, in, from the the flawed random source that's giving us y. Okay? And um, so, and we'll assume that y is chosen from a source with high entropy. For technical reasons, we need not just entropy, but min entropy, meaning the probability of any particular output isn't too high. Okay? Um, so min entropy k means no element is output with probability more than two to the negative k. And, um, and what um, we want is that this function E of SY um, produces randomness that's uh, L bits, that's almost K bits of randomness whenever it's given the output of such a, a source. And um, moreover, this, this randomness is almost uniform in the sense of L1 or, or statistical indistinguishability, okay, um, and uh, uncorrelated with the, the um, C, the randomness used to extract it. So we have to use randomness to get randomness, but that randomness that we get doesn't spoil the randomness that we used. So in particular, we can use, go on and use that same seed to extract randomness in the future from other sources. So, um, so I'll talk about how we get our hands on extractors in a minute, but let's assume this is, I'm going, let's reverse the polarity and go forwards in time. So um, assume we had an extractor, and moreover, we're going to make a big leap and assume that this extractor can extract exactly the right amount of randomness, all the randomness from the source. This is too good to be true, but it makes the presentation a lot cleaner than what we actually have to do. Okay? And, okay. So then, uh, as I said before, our, our generator is going to use the same idea as before, except instead of outputting f of x, we're going to take a, an additional input, the seed for the extractor, and use that to extract the randomness from f of x. Okay? Um, and, uh, and otherwise it's the same before, as before. We, we, um, so what does the output look like? It's going to be the seed which is the random L-bit string, randomly chosen independent of everything else. The extracted bits, which are going to be almost uniform and look like n, n bits of randomness, and that's in a statistical sense. Okay. The 
uh, inner product vector, that's n bits of randomness independent of everything else, and that inner product bit, which looks like a random bit. Okay, so it's exactly the amount of randomness we put in plus the additional gold right clavin bit. Okay, now, as I said, we can't really um, extract the same amount of randomness that we put in, and we're only getting one more bit out, and so if we lose any bits in the extraction process, we're done, we're doomed. So what we have to do instead is sort of do things en masse so that we get more Goldreich Levin bits uh, compare, compared to the bits that we have to sacrifice in the extraction process. But that's the main idea. Okay. Okay. Now, said, how do we get this extractor? Um, in, in that paper, we were trying to use extractors before extractors really existed. So we came up with a following kind of crude extractor. Okay? So sort of proto-extractor. Really, you want the, the seed to be much smaller than the input. We, we had an extractor where the seed was much longer, was at least the size of the input. Okay? But it was a strong extractor in that you didn't corrupt the seed, so it was still kind of worthwhile um, for our application. And the, the extractor we came up with was, was very simple. Uh, you had a family of pairwise independent um, um, hash functions that mapped um, m bits to your, the amount that you're going to extract, k prime. Okay. Pairwise independent means that any two inputs go, if you pick a function at random, go to random output places. And you just have the extractor apply, the, the hash function is the seed, and you have the extractor apply the hash function to, to the input. And what we proved is, you know, just by a um, uh, kind of um, variance argument, um, is that the uh, result of the hash function is indistinguishable. Um, if you sacrifice k prime bits, if you sacrifice t bits of randomness, it's um, close to the uniform distribution to within something that's exponentially small in t in the amount of bits that you sacrifice. Okay. But, uh, since then, people have come up with much better extractors. So, okay. Now, what do we do if the function isn't one to one? It's say q to one, where q is something pretty big. Okay. Um, so the idea was to extract, given f of x, x now has log q bits of entropy. So we're going to make the function more like a one-to-one -one function by extracting these bits of entropy. Okay? So we'll again use an extractor to take those qubits of, of, you know, to take the input. Okay? So we think of the source as given f of x, x could be anywhere in the pre-images of f of x. So that's our flawed random source. If we can extract the randomness from that flawed random source, then um, if we can extract all that randomness, then we're making the function one-to-one, -one and we go, we go to, the, to the previous step. Okay. So that's the, that's the idea there. Okay. Of course, to know how much to extract, you have to know how big that pre-image size is. So what if you don't know that the, you know, the, the pre-image size is variable, depends on your output, and, uh, and it's hard to compute. Well, then you can still combine these ideas in complicated ways and have it work, but it gets messy. Okay. Okay. So what have we done? Um, we started with a one-way function, which is, 
which is essentially what we argued was the weakest assumption that you could have to have meaningful cryptography. We got a, a cryptographically strong pseudorandom generator from this. Um, and we said that from that, we get a whole bunch of useful cryptographic tools, such as um, secure block ciphers, um, bit commitment, and zero knowledge. Okay. So, um, okay. But the other thing that I want to, so, so this is an important result for, for that reason. But the other thing I want to stress is that in the construction of these pseudorandom generators for cryptography, um, we both used and introduced combinatorial objects that had certain randomness properties or properties for dealing with randomness, um, such as extractors and locally, decod um, locally list decodable error correcting codes, which turned out to have much wider ramifications within complexity and beyond. Okay, so um, I still, there's 15 minutes before the break, but this is an obvious stopping point. Uh, I'm gonna start some pseudorandom generators for uh, probabilistic algorithms. So but why, why don't we take the break now? So, but uh, then we resume at four. Uh, I wanted to make it half an hour. So, okay. Starting and stopping now, so like uh, in 3.45 we can. Say, yeah. All right, last time is the boss. Break till 3.45. <laughs>